Ever wonder why some photos come out just right, while others come out too bright or too dark? Or why some photos come out like this? It all comes down to exposure. It's the foundation of every photo you'll ever take. Whether you're just starting out or refreshing your skills, I'll break down exposure in simple practical terms using real world examples starting from the ground up and I'll show you how to take control of your camera. Let's start with the basics. What exactly is exposure? Put simply, exposure is the amount of light that makes its way to your camera's sensor or film. Too much light, your image is overexposed. Too little light, your image is underexposed. Sounds simple, right? And at its core, it is simple. But the factors that contribute to exposure can seem complex and overwhelming at first. Think of it like filling a glass of water. You can pour quickly with a strong stream, or slowly with a gentle trickle. In this analogy, the fullness of the glass represents our exposure. Partially full, that's underexposed. Overflowing, overexposed. And when it's filled just right, that's a correctly exposed image. Keep this in mind, because we'll come back to it. In photography terms, exposure boils down to a simple equation. The intensity of light multiplied by the amount of time it is allowed to hit your camera sensor or film. Exposure is managed by three key settings, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. And together, they form what's called the exposure triangle. Each of these settings controls light in its own way, and each has a unique effect on your photos. Aperture is like the pupil of your camera, controlling how much light enters by adjusting the size of the opening. Just like your pupil dilates in dark conditions and contracts in bright light, your camera aperture works the same way. Aperture is measured in f-stops. Small numbers indicate a large opening, letting in lots of light, while large numbers represent a small opening, letting in much less light. Unlike the name of my channel, you do in fact want to f-stop. Here's another way to think about it. Imagine aperture like a faucet. It controls the flow of light just as the faucet controls the stream of water filling a glass. But instead of water, we're working with light. Let me show you exactly how this works. I've created this setup using a light a camera, and a paper screen. The camera's back is open, allowing light to pass through the lens and project out of the camera onto our paper screen, just like the light would normally hit your camera sensor or film. This setup isolates the effect of aperture. The intensity of the light is constant, and the video camera recording the screen is locked at a fixed exposure. We're only gonna change one thing, the aperture. Right now, the aperture is wide open at f1.7, Watch what happens as I gradually close it down to f16. As the aperture gets smaller, the amount of light passing through decreases. By the time we reach f16, only about 1% of the light that entered at f1.7 is getting through. The same thing happens in your camera. Changing just the aperture while keeping everything else constant gives us this. Brighter images with a wide aperture, darker images as you stop down. But here's where aperture gets really interesting. It doesn't just control the quantity of light. Watch what happens to the background as I change the aperture from f2.8 to f22. Here's another example. The focus stays on the closest post, but notice how much more of the scene comes into focus as we stop the aperture down. This effect is called depth of field. A wide aperture gives you a shallow depth of field. Only a small part of the scene is in focus. A stop-down aperture creates a deep depth of field, where much more is in focus. Most lenses show a scale of depth of field, or how much of the scene will be in focus at any given aperture. This is a very unique lens, but it does a great job of showing depth of field. And now for the second part of our exposure triangle, shutter speed. Here's the shutter on one of my film cameras. While there are many types of shutters, they all serve the same purpose. Controlling how long your camera's sensor, or film, is exposed to light. Think of your camera's shutter as a lightning-fast door. Shutter speed is simply how long that door stays open to let in light. From tiny fractions of a second to several minutes. Remember our water analogy? Shutter speed is like the time we leave the faucet running. We can quickly fill the glass with a strong stream over a short time, or we can slowly fill it over a longer time. Both give us the same amount of water, or in our case, light. But shutter speed does more than just control light. It determines how we capture motion. At 1 1,000th of a second, we can freeze fast-moving water in midair, while at half a second, fast-moving water becomes silky smooth. However, there's a catch when shooting handheld. Slow shutter speeds can introduce unwanted blur from your natural hand movement. Here's a simple rule to help. 
Set your shutter speed to at least one over your focal length. So with a 50 millimeter lens, aim for at least 1 50th of a second or faster. And now for the final piece of our exposure triangle, ISO. ISO measures your camera's sensitivity to light, whether that's your digital sensor's sensitivity or the speed of your film. Low ISO numbers mean low sensitivity, perfect for bright conditions. High numbers mean high sensitivity, letting you shoot in darker situations. Remember our water glass? ISO is like choosing the size of your glass. A low ISO of 100 is like a large measuring cup. It takes more time to fill. A high ISO of 3200 is like a shot glass. It fills very quickly. But there's a trade-off. The higher your ISO, the more grain or noise it's introduced. Let me show you an extreme example. At 100,000 ISO, the image is overwhelmed by grain and noise, making it unusable. In contrast, 50 ISO delivers a perfectly clean and smooth result. In most cases, keep ISO low for crisp, clean images. But when light is scarce, don't hesitate to raise it. Capturing the moment is more important than grain-free images. Experiment with your camera to find the highest ISO that still gives you acceptable results, especially since newer cameras handle noise better. Let's see how these three settings work together to create the perfect exposure. Think of exposure like a set of balanced scales. If you adjust one setting, you need to counterbalance it with another to maintain the same brightness. Let me show you a real example. Here I am with my camera set up overlooking a roadway at night. I've chosen an aperture of 1 30th of a second at f4.0 with ISO 3200. But after reviewing the photo, I want less motion blur in the cars. To freeze the motion, I need a faster shutter speed. Let's adjust that. I've doubled my shutter speed to 1 60th of a second. Notice how the image is darker now? That's because the faster shutter speed lets in half as much light. This is where the balancing act comes into play. To compensate, I can double my ISO to 6400, making the camera twice as sensitive to light. Now the brightness is back to where we started. But let's explore another option. If I reduce the ISO back to 3200 and instead open my aperture to f2.8, I let in twice as much light through the lens, balancing the exposure again. Here's the magic. All three of these combinations give the same overall brightness, but each creates a unique look. The first has the most motion blur, the second is a little noisier due to higher ISO, the third is slightly softer because of the wider aperture. In photography we call these equal steps stops. Each stop either doubles or halves the light. Now for the fun part, let's see these settings in action with some real world examples that'll make you want to grab your camera and start shooting. First up, how shutter speed transforms motion. With a very high shutter speed, every drop of water is frozen in time. With a medium shutter speed, we get a gentle sense of movement. With a long shutter speed, we get that dreamy, silky smooth effect you've probably seen on Instagram. The same principle applies to any moving subject. You can freeze every detail of an athlete in midair, capture a bird's wings with perfect clarity, or transform busy streets into rivers of light. Here's an example of using a slower shutter speed to track a moving subject, creating a blurred background that conveys a sense of speed. Here's a quick tip for sharp action shots. The faster the subject, the faster your shutter speed needs to be. Now let's take a closer look at depth of field. Portraits are often shot with very wide apertures to isolate your subject and create that dreamy blurred background, perfect for drawing attention to faces while softening everything else. Macro shots are detailed close-ups taken at medium apertures like f4 to f6.3 can keep more of your subject in focus while still having some background blur. Landscapes captured at moderately small apertures like f8 to f11 maintain sharpness across the entire scene. High apertures like f16 or f22 can be useful for keeping both the foreground and background sharp, reducing light for daytime long exposures, or increasing depth of field in macro photography. However, these settings often come with a trade-off. Reduced image sharpness due to diffraction. Take a look at these comparisons. Notice how much sharper the images are when using an aperture closer to the lens's sweet spot, typically two to three stops down from wide open. There's a lot more to explore when it comes to depth of field and achieving maximum sharpness, but we'll save that deep dive for another time. But what about when light is scarce? Handheld, use a high ISO and wide aperture to freeze motion and capture the energy of city streets at night or during quiet moments of the early morning. Grab a tripod and extend your exposure time to seconds to capture stars, glowing cityscapes, or breathtaking auroras. With long exposure, 
Light becomes your paintbrush. Experiment and have fun creating unique effects. Now that you've seen what's possible, let's talk about a tool that'll help you nail these shots every time. Your camera's light meter. See this scale in your viewfinder? This is your light meter. It tells you whether your current settings will produce a bright, dark, or balanced exposure. When the indicator is in the middle, your camera estimates you have a correct exposure. The numbers on the left indicate one, two, or three stops of underexposure, while the right side shows overexposure. But here's the thing. Your camera's light meter is just a guide. Think of it as your trusted advisor and not your boss. Use it as a starting point and adjust from there based on the look you're going for. For example, in this scene, if you only meter the white building, a small bright spot in the scene, your camera will recommend one exposure setting. But if you meter the shadowed road instead, it will suggest something entirely different. While your camera's meter works well in most situations, this demonstrates where it can occasionally fall short. We'll dive deeper into metering modes in a future video, but for now I recommend checking your camera manual to familiarize yourself with how your specific meter works. Getting started with exposure can feel intimidating, but it doesn't have to. Use your camera's semi-automatic modes to ease into it before tackling full manual control. Shutter priority. You control the shutter speed and the camera adjusts the aperture. Use this when you want to control motion. Use this for fast-moving subjects like sports or wildlife, or when you want to add intentional motion blur. Aperture priority. You control aperture, your camera adjusts shutter speed. Perfect for when you want to control depth of field. Taking portraits with a blurred background is a good use case. It's my go-to mode. When you're comfortable with these modes, step up to manual mode, where you control everything. Experimenting with each mode will help you better understand how the settings interact. Another great tool is exposure compensation available in aperture priority, shutter priority, and program modes. It lets you fine tune the brightness of your photo, making it lighter or darker than your meter suggests. Mastering exposure isn't just about technical settings. It's about transforming what you see into the photo you imagined. Now it's your turn. Grab your camera, get out there, put these tips into practice, and let me know how it went in the comments and what you discovered. Thank you so much for watching. This is my first time sharing these concepts with a broader audience, so I'd love to hear your feedback on how I can make these videos even better. If you found this helpful, subscribe for more photography tips, techniques, and projects. See you next time.